And a very good morning to you once again. Great to be with you and great to be able to share the Word of God as always. Well, I'm off my feet for another couple of weeks, so you'll have to excuse me sitting down like I have been doing for the last few weeks. And today we're going to do this from my office instead of from the pulpit for a number of reasons. But it's the same word and it's my privilege to be able to share with you. We continue with our journey through the Bible narratives and this week we're going to be having a look at the story of Jacob and his wives that we find in Genesis 29 right through to Genesis 30 verse 24 and I encourage you just to have a look at that sometime. Well last week we had a look at Jacob's encounter with with God at the place that he called Bethel, the house of God and very interestingly there are many Uh, rabbis, Jewish scholars that believe that the city of Luz, which um, Jacob renamed Bethel, is actually the exact same place where the most holy place would have been built when the temple was built. So that Bethel, the house of God, was indeed the house of God. Anyway, that stairway encounter taught us that we need to meet God for ourselves on his terms, in his rest, and that's when we get to actually know him. And when we do, our commitment to him becomes obvious. For today, I'm just going to give you a quick uh, rundown of the story of Jacob and his wives. It's a long passage, and I encourage you, as I said, to read it. And then we're going to have a look at a few lessons, as we usually do. So Jacob's en route to find a wife uh, from Padam, Uh, Aram, and we know that that's where his mother's brother Laban lived. After his encounter at Bethel, he continues to go eastwards, and there he meets some shepherds who are busy waiting for the full complement to come in, and then they roll the stone away, and then they water their sheep. Uh, So he asks them whether they know Laban, his uncle, his mother's brother, and they, they reply to the affirmative, and then they say, hang on, here comes Rachel, his daughter. Uh, who happens to be a shepherdess. And immediately there's this emotional moment between Rachel and Jacob as he reveals his identity. She runs off and tells her dad, and her dad Laban runs back to meet Jacob excitedly and brings Jacob into his home. Then Jacob's been working for Laban for about a month when Laban asks Jacob what wages he wants. Uh, because he doesn't expect him to work for nothing. And then I read from Genesis 29, verse 16. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah. The name of the younger was Rachel. Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel was lovely in form and beautiful. Jacob was in love with Rachel and said, I'll work for you for seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. And verse 20 says, so Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. Jacob says to Laban, my seven years is done. I want my wages. So Laban throws a feast for the crowd. Lots of merrymaking and drinking, no lights, takes his daughter into Jacob. Jacob awakes in the morning and discovers Leah, the sister, the wrong one. So Jacob, the deceiver, gets deceived. In verse 25, the Bible records, When morning came, there was Leah. So Jacob said to Laban, What is this that you've done to me? I served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? Laban replied, It's not our custom here to give the younger daughter in marriage before the older one. Finish this daughter's bridal week, then I will give you the younger one also in return for another seven years of work. And Jacob did so. He finished the week with Leah, and then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. We know as well from the story that Laban also gave the maidservant Zilpah to Leah and Bilhah, to Rachel. So now Jacob had uh, his two wives and his two wives made servants in the house. Now we can understand lots of frustration, lots of competition, lots of jealousy took place between Leah who was more fertile and who produced for Jacob a lot sooner than Rachel did and then Rachel. And over time both Rachel and Leah handed their maid servants 
to Jacob to make babies for them. And from these four women came the 12 tribes of Israel. That's another story for another time. So there's a bit of background which I encourage you to read for yourselves. Yes, this is the story of Jacob's love for Rachel and the deception of Laban and his forcing Jacob to work for him for 20 years. See, Genesis is a book about people. Each story, each event in Genesis is given to demonstrate the fact that God works through his people and that people are accountable to him. God is working through Jacob to bring about a nation that he promised to Abraham. He's working out his plan through his people that he created. And just like Jacob is part of that plan, you and I are also part of God's plan, his story, history. The story of Jacob and Haran can teach us lots of important lessons in our walk with God. And we're going to have a look at some of those lessons this morning. I believe that Haran, the place where Laban lived, is meant to represent the testings that follow our commitment. Remember that Jacob met God at Bethel. He made a commitment to him there. And this is what happened next in the story. It wasn't just all hunky-dory after Jacob's um, commitment. Quite the contrary. He went into a time of severe testing. So here's lesson number one. Lesson number one for us today. Jacob learns to trust God. Jacob learns to trust God. And by implication, we need to learn to trust God. And maybe that, that, that in, it involves different stages of our lives at different times and in different ways. But we never stop learning to trust God. For Jacob, like for many of us, and now I refer specifically to younger people, the biggest question of our youth concerns love and marriage. And in a good way, Jacob learns to trust God for a wife. It was not just that he fled from his brother, his murderous brother Esau, but he also was purposed to finding a wife that would have been pleasing to him and also, as you might remember, pleasing to his parents. See, his pursuit and his ambitions were good. Proverbs 18.22 tells us, He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Now we can imagine Jacob traveling for one to two months on the back of a camel, praying for a wife, you know, as the camel loped along. Then he arrives in Haran and sets his eyes on Rachel and it's love at first sight. Now, after two months on the back of a camel, perhaps any person of the female species would have been an irresistible attraction to him. But we learn that Rachel was truly something special And Jacob was willing to do anything to have her. But notice that Jacob would only have Rachel in God's way. And here's a lesson for us, friends. Those things that we really desire, whether it's a wife, whether it's a promotion, whether it's a a pay increase, whether it's a new something, whatever it is, Jacob was set on a course of only doing it God's way. He shows her respect. He courts her. He works for seven years for her. And then in one of the most romantic verses in the whole of Scripture, verse 20, Genesis 29, we read, Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. So during this time, we see Jacob is faithful. He and Rachel kept themselves sexually pure. Their relationship develops from physical attraction to a deep love for one another. Jacob shows his value for Rachel. He shows his patience, his self-control. And the only way he could have done this, and the only way you and I can do it, is because we learn to trust God for that situation. And that's what Jacob did. He had learned or was learning to trust God for his wife. So unlike the Hollywood of today and the stories and the movies and the TV and the books, isn't it? Nowadays, you try before you buy. You find out if you're sexually compatible before you marry and all sorts of other horrible anti-God things that we get up to. 
The Bible is very clear that we are to keep the marriage bed pure. In other words, keep the bed pure for marriage. And young people, I speak specifically to you, and maybe older who are not yet married or are going to be remarried or whatever the case is. Let's just stick with God's word. Let's learn to trust him. And he then gives us what we need and what we long for. So he was there for a wife, Jacob. He trusted God for her in spite of the long road to get her. Friends, the truth is, meeting God on the mountain top is often followed by a very real need to learn to trust Him in the valleys, in all situations, and in all circumstances. You know, those mountain top experiences are great. But it's when we go down the other side, when things start getting tough, when the rubber really hits the road, that we need to learn to trust God as Jacob did. Lesson number two. Jacob remains faithful when tested. Jacob remains faithful when tested. And this is my challenge to us again this morning, that when testing comes, and it does, that we would remain faithful. See, Jacob's testing here in Haran comes in the form of a being the recipient of Laban's deception. Interesting. The deceiver is being deceived. There's a spiritual principle here, folks, of sowing and reaping. Galatians 6-7 says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. So Laban is actually a greater deceiver Then Jacob, he deceived Jacob into working for him, marrying Leah, working another seven years to get what he had already paid for. The most stunning deception has to be the wedding switch. It might not make sense to our minds how this could happen, but here's the context. After a full day of celebration, the bride would be brought to the bedroom by her father. She would be covered from head to toe, veiled. It's night time. There are no electric lights around. It's quite possible that Jacob himself was under the influence. I mean, if they're celebrating with, with wine the whole day, he's probably a bit, you know, on his plonk, <laughs> intoxicated, although we're not given the specific piece of information in the text. But voila, he wakes up the next morning after consummating his marriage with the wrong person. Jacob experiences the exact Same betrayal and deception that he had dished out on his brother Esau and his father Isaac. Now, while necessary, it wasn't a pleasant lesson to learn by any means. But Jacob is learning through his adversity. The lesson is difficult, but Jacob fulfills his vows and submits to the Lord. See, he stays faithful rather than walking away. And he learns the important lesson of walking with God. Friends, you know, that's often our first reaction when adversity comes. Adversity comes in our marriage. Adversity comes in our workplace. Adversity comes in the church. Adversity comes with our friends. Our our response is is to want to run away. But Jacob teaches us a different sort of character. He learns the important lesson of sticking it out. And walking with God. He remains faithful under his testing. And he challenges us, I believe, in the story to do the same. See, whether it's our fault or not, reaping our stuff or not, the lesson is to remain faithful. Lesson number three this morning, and it's my last lesson. Jacob discovers that commitment to God implies an opportunity to show it. Commitment to God implies an opportunity to show it or to prove it. Let me explain what I mean. Jacob had a mountaintop experience at Bethel. He meets the God of his father standing at the top of the stairway and he introduces himself as I am Yahweh. He introduces himself as the Lord. Jacob then builds his place of worship and declares his commitment to God. I mean, this is a mountaintop of mountaintop experiences. He's revved up and raring to go. But almost as soon as Jacob begins his journey with the Lord, 
these trials and obstacles come into his life, he's fur forced to work for his uncle Laban for 20 years. Seven years for Leah, the wife he didn't want. Another seven years for Rachel, the wife he did want. And then after fulfilling all those requirements, Laban entices him to work for another six years to earn the flocks that he had built up on his own accord anyway. Another story for another time. So he's tricked by Laban over and over again, even when he's doing the right thing. Far away from home, deprived of his mom and dad, etc., etc., and his home comforts and things. It might just seem so unfair. But the point is this. Every commitment we make to God implies an opportunity to prove it. Jacob had made commitments. Now was the time to back up his mouth by his action. See, there is a heron in the life of every believer who desires to follow God. Times and trial and testing will usually always follow commitment. And suffering is sometimes a part of that. I always warn new believers You know, that joy of knowing your sins forgiven, that first time you encounter the Lord in in all His grace and mercy and forgiveness and that weight of your sin is taken off off of your shoulders and you feel like you can just conquer the world. And I say to people, just be careful, you know, not to be a killjoy by any means. Enjoy this moment, but be aware that the enemy is not happy and that times of trial and testing do do come. I also warn people when they've been through the waters of believers' baptism, I don't think there's a single time I've ever heard a single person I've ever had the privilege and joy of baptizing telling me, man, the week after my baptism was wonderful. (laughs) It's normally the worst week of their lives. And I always warn them, the enemy is not happy. And there's also this time of, of backing up your mouth by your commitment. See, it was true for Jesus, it's going to be true for us. Hebrews 2.10 says, In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, through whom and for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. Jesus was made perfect through suffering. Why, why would we be any different? 1 Peter 2.21 says, To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Friends, you know, Jesus said, John 16.33, In this world you will have trial and tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome this world. Testings, trials, tribulations, that's part of our humanity. It's not all hunky-dory, pie-in-the-sky, mountain-top, floaty-floaty, whoopy whoopy <laughs> as we go along. We, we are real people in a real fallen world with real situations and real circumstances. And then on top of that, we, we are longing to serve our real God. And oftentimes, that, those commitments we make at stages in our lives and, and daily in our lives... Lord, today I'm going to, is often followed by, back it up, back up your mouth with a commitment. See, Jacob made a commitment to God, and it was followed with testing and not by ease. When God allows times of trial, we need to learn to keep worshipping Him for who He is, and not for what He does or what we think He doesn't do. Jacob's experiences teach us that when we bow to God at Bethel, We are going to walk with him in Haran. Did you get that? When we bow to God at Bethel in our commitments, our daily commitments, our big commitments, whatever they are, we are going to walk with him in Haran. Commitment to God implies an opportunity to prove it. Unfortunately for many people, and it's particularly immature believers, the first response to trial is, Why me, Lord? (laughs) Why me, Lord? You know, not why me, Lord. What have I ever done? Not not that song. But why me, Lord? Why, why, Why do I have to face this? Why does this come upon me? Why, 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 why? Well, why not you? 
Come on. I mean, why not you? <laughs> Is your sin any less than anybody else's sin? You know, are you living a less living in a less fallen world than everybody else is living in. I mean, this, this is where we're at. But what we need to remember is that God is in unchanging in His love and His goodness and His kindness towards us. We know that in all things He works for the good of those who love Him and who are called according to His purposes. He is the unchanging God. Hebrews chapter 12 encourages us in verse 7. Endure hardship as discipline. So whatever it is, whatever hardship you're going through, endure it, recognize it, accept it as discipline. It says God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. No discipline, verse 11, seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may be not be disabled, but rather healed. Friends, our commitment to God, our walk with Him, our daily walk to, with Him is always going to provide an opportunity to prove it. To back up our actions with our words and how we deal with difficult times, difficult circumstances, difficult seasons. I mean, sometimes it's like it's never going to end, you know. We all have these seasons in our lives. It's how we deal with it. The God of Bethel, the God of the mountaintop, the God in that place of the most glorious worship is the same God who will walk with us in Haran. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. Jacob teaches us that this morning. So in conclusion, let me summarize. Lesson number one, Jacob learns to trust God and we need to learn to trust God. What are we trusting him for? Whatever it is. In Jacob's case, it was that wife. He learned to trust God and he stayed pure and he stayed devoted to God. In spite of everything that happened, we need to learn to trust God. Number two, Jacob remained faithful when he, tested, when he was tested. All that stuff he went through, 20 years of working for his mother's brother <laughs> before he finally got to leave. And yet he remained faithful to God. Are you remaining faithful to God in your time of testing? And number three, Jacob discovered that commitment implies, commitment to God implies an opportunity to prove it. And for each one of us, it's exactly the same. How we deal with that place of Haran will determine, you know, how deep we are walking with God and uh, how much we understand about him. So I just encourage you with that story of Jacob and his wives. We don't want to talk about the two wives issue and all the rest of it. Another story for another time. But let's just close there. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you that you've taught us this morning that even in difficult times, and especially in difficult times, we need to learn to trust you. We need to remain faithful to you. And we need to use those times as an opportunity to back up our mouths with our actions. And I thank you that you never abandon us. You never leave us, no matter how deep, dark that valley is that we're going through. And I know, Lord, right now there are many that hear my voice that are going through the most horrific, terrible times, uh, emotionally, maybe uh, financially, maybe relationally, Lord, whatever it is, I thank you that we can hold on to you, knowing that you walk with us in that place of Haran. 
Thank you for the Beth Els. Thank you for the mountaintop experiences. But thank you, Lord, also for these difficult times where we learn more about ourselves, more about you, more and more about your love for us. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining with me again this morning. And God willing, we'll be back with another Bible narrative next week. And I think we're going to start looking at Joseph. So for now, bye-bye.